All right, now in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to skip down here. The verse number 7 is starting where I want to focus in this chapter. Um, look at verse number 7. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. What, what's happening here is that you know, Paul is receiving lots of revelations. Obviously, when you read through the New Testament, a lot of, the, of what you're reading are the epistles of Paul. Paul received a lot of revelation by God you know, to, to have the scripture given by the Apostle Paul. And what he's saying here is that lest he should be exalted above measure. See, you, you never want one man to just be lifted up too high in men's eyes, especially because... Um, you know, it's not, the revelations weren't about Paul. They're about God. They're about Jesus Christ. You know, um, just because he's being used mightily, God doesn't want him being lifted up too high just as an individual because he's not, shouldn't be, and is not the focus. Now, is he a great Christian? Absolutely. He's a great man of God and someone that we should emulate like so many of the other great men of God. But basically what he's saying here is that he received a thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what that is. I've heard different theories on this. We don't know ultimately exactly what it is. He had some kind of injury or some kind of an ailment. Some, something happened physically. It says the messenger of Satan to Buffett. Buffett means to hit. You know, a messenger of Satan was sent, so he probably was injured. Lest I should be exalted above measure. And he says, basically, this has happened because... Um, he says, lest I be exalted above measure, above that which is you know, worthy of him to be exalted. Um, because of all the abundance of the revelations he's preaching, you know, there was this messenger of Satan to buffet him. And he says in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. So he went to God in prayer three times, asking you know, for God to help him, for God to heal him, or, or take away whatever that thorn in the flesh was. And God answered him, he says, in verse number 9, and this is what we're going to focus on, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And what we're going to be preaching about tonight is that statement that, that God responded to the Apostle Paul with, that my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, God wants to show his strength and his might and his strong arm and do these great miracles, but he really likes doing those types of things with people who are, who are weaker, with, with you know, going against the odds. And we're going to look at some examples of that in the Bible. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You're in 2 Corinthians. Just flip back to 1 Corinthians in chapter number 1. We're going to see a little bit into uh, who God is and who he wants to use and, and, and how he gets glory unto his name. And, um, you know, by this statement, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Look at verse number 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 25, verse 25 says, Because the, foolish of God, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that... Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence." But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. See, one of the reasons we get here from this, from this passage that we just read, that it says that God has not called many wise men after the flesh, right? I mean, people who are naturally like really smart and bright and they're, they have the wisdom of this world. It says not many mighty not many noble. Now, does it mean that there's zero people that are, that are mighty? No, no. He just says not many. You know, that's not the person typically who God chooses to use as much. Now, if there is a mighty man that wants to serve God with all their heart and they want to do what God asks them to do, hey, God's going to use that person. You better believe it. But God really likes choosing specific people to do certain things 
that's going to bring way more honor and glory unto his name. So like, you think about this, a perfect example with David and Goliath, right? God could have chosen many people to be the one to, to go out and to, and to kill Goliath and to be the, the, you know, the savior of Israel in that instance, in that scenario. Now, Goliath was obviously, he was a giant. He was huge. He was a man of war, real strong, real valiant. Now, God's not going to use another giant like that, you know, another man who might be like close to equal or stronger or whatever, because then God's not going to get the glory for that victory. Men are going to look at that and say, oh, well, yeah, this guy's just stronger than him. And he could have even used King Saul. Remember, King Saul was a king. He was head and shoulders above the rest. When Saul was anointed king, which he was king at the time of this battle with David and Goliath, Saul was taller than all the other men of Israel. So by nature, naturally, he was kind of a, you know, a, a mighty man. He was a, you know, he was a, he was a man of valor. So probably even if he were to go out there, he was a man of war. He was experienced in battle. If he were to go out, God wouldn't have gotten as much glory as he did when he chose David. David, the Bible says, was a ruddy man. He was of a fair countenance, which means he had, you know, he had a pretty face. He wasn't, he wasn't war beaten. You know, he, he didn't have all the battle scars and stuff. And um, he wasn't just this, you know, what, when people looked at him, like when Goliath looked at him, he's like, you despise me like you're sending dogs out to me. Like he had zero respect whatsoever. He looked at it like it was a joke that David was going out to battle against him. But God's strength is made perfect in weakness. See, when man looks at something and he sees there's no way, this can't happen, and then it does, that gets men to think, well, you know, how did that happen? And God, and, and we see in that story of David and Goliath, I'm not going to turn it, we've gone over this in the past, but um, God gets all the credit for that victory. David gives God the credit. Saul gives God the credit that the Lord saved their people. When David slew Goliath, when he, when he slung that stone and hit him in the head, when he, when he killed Goliath, God got the praise. God got the glory. It was against all odds. David was physically weaker. He was, in, in every way, he was inferior to um, Goliath, except in the fact that David believed in the Lord, which is all you need. You don't need, you know, to be a mighty man. You don't need all these other physical attributes. If God be for us, who can be against us? That's, was the, that's the important thing. And see, God likes to use people like that. And that's why it says here in 1 Corinthians 1, where it says, not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He says, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God likes taking the foolishness in this world, what people think is foolish, to just to confound the wise. So that the wise people, they, they don't get it. They, they're confounded. They have no answer for it. God hath chosen, he says, the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. God likes using those things because it gives him the glory. And that's what it says, in, look at verse number 29. This is the whole purpose of all these things. The base things which are despised, God hath chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Verse 29 sums it all up, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It's not man's job to glory of themselves in God's presence. When God does something, he's going to make it known. He's going to use the weak things. He's going to use the beggarly elements of this world to bring glory unto his name and to bring great victories. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to see here when David is actually chosen to be the next king of Israel. When Samuel is sent, after, after Saul has disobeyed God, he offers up the sacrifice, you know, it's already known that Saul's going to be replaced. God sends Samuel then to go and anoint the next king of Israel. And this is the story that we're getting into in 1 Samuel 16. First Samuel chapter number 16, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. This is, this is the first son of Jesse that was brought before Samuel. So Samuel sees Eliab. And you got to remember too, when Samuel anointed Saul, Saul was head and shoulders above the rest. Saul was, was a mighty man. You know, he, was, he was someone that looked like he should be the king. So now we see Samuel. He says when, when he looked on Eliab, he said, 
surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Like, this must be the next king when he looked at Eliab. Verse number 7 says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, don't look at his face, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And God's saying, look, you don't see things the same way that I do. We oftentimes look, because we're in this world, we look at things physically. We just look and see, you know, if you have a battle, if you have to fight a war, well, we have this many troops and he has that many troops and this is, and this is the whole equation, right? If you're going to get in a fight with somebody or like there's boxing matches, right? They have all the different classes and you're pitting people against each other with their physical strength. When God looks at a battle, when God's looking at people in general, he doesn't see that stuff. He doesn't see those physical attributes. What he's looking at is your heart. And when he's, when he's looking for someone to rule his people, especially, you know, a king, a king in God's eyes is different than a king in the people's eyes. If you remember, the reason why the children of Israel wanted a king in the first place is because they wanted somebody to go out and fight their battles for them. They wanted someone to offer them protection. That was their whole purpose in asking for a king. Obviously, they didn't trust in God. But see, God looks at the heart. God, when God's going to choose someone to be the king over those people, he's going to look for someone whose heart is right with God, not someone who necessarily has all the physical attributes and is just the biggest, tallest person in the land to be the king. God doesn't look at it that way. He says, no, I'm going to look at the heart and see if they're going to do right by me because that's way more important. You have way more power. You have way more influence when you're doing things God's way and when you have a heart that is obedient to God and wants to serve God, you'll get a lot farther and you can get a lot more things accomplished than just relying on your physical attributes. Jump down to verse number 11 of 1 Samuel 16 because he goes through all of the children, right? God explains to Samuel, look, God doesn't see the same way you do. So all the children of, of Jesse pass before Samuel and God hasn't chosen any of them. Look at verse number 11. It says, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. And this is where it describes David. Now, he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. God saw him. This is someone, you know, he's ruddy, he's beautiful, you know, a good looking guy. But he's saying, this is going to be the king. You know, again, most people in those days, especially you're looking at a king as a warrior, someone to lead in the battles. And, you know, this is a little bit removed from us today because now our commander in chief, so to speak, just sits in an office somewhere and sends other people's kids out to die. He's not going and, and stepping his feet on the ground over there and leading our troops in the battle for these righteous causes. He doesn't care about that. He's not going to put his neck on the line for that. Although back in this day, that's what kings would do. They would lead their, their people in the battle. They would be fighting for their cause and that's what they were, a true leader. Our, our president today, uh, and you know, it's not just with Obama, it's with you know, going back for a long time now that they just, just push buttons and, and, and make decisions to send other people's kids off and um, they're not going to step anywhere near a battlefield because they're a bunch of cowards. But um, this is what, when they're looking at it, when God explains, you know, God doesn't look the same way you do. God doesn't look at people the same way. He's going to look at their heart. And that's what matters to them. And again, David was someone, he was made strong through his own perceived weakness. Right? But the strength that what really matters is strength in his faith in the Lord. And that's what matters for you. You know, when, when you're feeling um, beaten or, or, you know, broken down or you feel like, I can't really do much for God. I don't have much going for me. I can't speak well, whatever it may be. First, make sure that your heart is right with God because that's what God's going to look at. God's going to look at your heart. If you have a heart to serve Him, hey, rejoice in your weaknesses. Rejoice in your downcomings because that just gives you more opportunity to be used of God because he'll, His... his um, his glory will be made known through your weakness. Turn, if you would, to Judges chapter number 7. We're going to see another example here of, um, of God 
using a small number of people. See, God uses, tries to bring great victories. Judges chapter number 7, God likes to bring great victories in Israel through using small numbers, small amounts of people against all odds, like it was with David and Goliath. We're going to look at Judges chapter number 7, verse 1. We're going to see the story of Gideon. Story of Gideon in verse number 1 of Judges chapter 7. The Bible reads, Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mori in the valley. Now, at this time, the Midianites were, were kind of, you know, had them under tribute. They were persecuting them, even to the point to where, like, nobody could have any weapons. There was no blacksmith in the land because the Midianites didn't want them rising up against them. So they couldn't even have these weapons. And um, we're going to see here Gideon is basically called on to to deliver the children of Israel out of, the, out of the Midianites' hand. Verse number 2 says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. So God looks at this right away. He sees all these people that have, that have, have, got, have come behind Gideon to go to fight. God looks at all those people. He says, Wait, wait, wait. There is just too many people here. He says, I don't want Israel to think that by their own strength and by their own might, they brought this victory against them. Because God's already saying, you know, he's going to deliver the Midianites into their hand. They're going to win this battle. And God says, I don't want them thinking that it's because of what they did. I don't want them to think they were so powerful and they were so mighty and don't give me the credit, give God the credit for what, for what he's going to do for them. So it says here, verse number three, it says, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And the return of the people, 20 and 2,000, and the remain 10,000. So we see here, God looked at their number. There were 32,000 troops, right? And God said, that's too many. So he says, okay, first just get rid of the people who are afraid. You don't want people who are afraid fighting for you anyways because they're going to lead a bunch of people off retreating when, when things get tough. You don't, you, know, you don't want the whole spirit of your battle going, going, um, going away when, uh, when, things, when, when uh, the battle comes. But anyways, so 22,000 people leave. They're left with 10,000 troops. And look what it says in verse 4. It says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. So, so just picture this, right? He brings them down. There's, there's, a, there's a, you know, a body of water there. And everyone goes down to drink. And some of the people are taking the water, and they're taking their hand, and they're bringing it up to their mouth, and they're drinking that way. Other people are just getting down on their hands and knees and just putting their mouth straight into the water and just drinking the water that way. This is what the two, the two people are doing. And it says there were only 300 that brought the water up to their mouth and, and um, drank it that way. It says in verse 7, And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. Let all the other people go, every man unto his place. Jump down to verse number 12, because we're going to see what kind of an army that they're facing of the Midianites. God chose 300 men. Look at verse number 12. It says, And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. We're talking about this, this huge army, this invading force, the Midianites. It says they were, the, um, they were like grasshoppers for multitude, just all along, just scattered all along the land, just all these people. And it says their camels were without number. Now, you typically have less camels than people in your army, right? I mean, camels is, is, a, is one resource that you have 
in the battle, um, kind of like people would fight on horseback, they also fight on camelback, and they'd also be used to bring supplies and other things with for the battle. It says their camels were without number. We have a number for the children of Israel, 32,000 originally. Now, you can say right off the bat, 32,000 versus just an innumerable multitude was already having the odds pretty far stacked against you. But now you can see why 22,000 people were afraid. They did not match up against the Midianites. Now, they showed up to fight, but they didn't match their strength at all. 22,000 people left. They're like, okay, we're out of here. But God still didn't even want to use the 10,000 people. He says, nope, that's too many. He chose 300. Anybody today, if you were going to say, who's going to win this battle? We've got 300 people over here. 300 people is just the size of a, of a big church. Of a, not even a big church. It's a, you know, a, 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 I guess you could say an average sized church. Obviously, we're a small church. But you could say a church, you have about 300 people, right? Filled room. That against an entire nation's army. I mean, put that against like the army of the United States. Who do you think is going to win? <laughs> That's a no-brainer, right? Well, God doesn't see the way man sees. And this is the way that God's going to say, I'm going to get the victory. And you're going to see that it's by me. It has nothing to do with your flesh. It has nothing to do with your strength. It has nothing to do with how powerful you think you are. It's not going to come by 32,000 people. It's going to come by 300 people. And that's exactly what he does. He delivers the people into their hand. And um, I'm not going to go into the whole rest of the story. You can read it for yourself if you want. They put their pit, um, lights inside of pitchers and they break them. And they say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And basically it caused all the other people to get in a panic and they run over themselves. And, and, and God makes a great victory with that. It's a great story. But we see here that God's strength is shown in that perceived weakness, that weakness of 300 men. And that just proves that God is the one behind it and not man. So if you have someone that's already an eloquent speaker, you know, maybe a natural leader in everything that they do, um, that leads a congregation that's maybe a pastor of a church, it's easier for people to say that that was done, well, it's because of his own ability. It's because he's just a natural born leader and he could do all these things. And there is actually a lot of people that are like that today. There are people and they, and they pass their churches and a lot of them are either false prophets or just unsaved. Now look, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that that's every single person. I'm not saying you can't have a good man of God that was naturally had these skills to lead and to, and to, and to do these things. But God likes using the people that I think didn't, didn't already have those skills to begin with. I think God likes to use a person that doesn't have all those natural abilities, but that he can bring glory unto his name um, and that he can get more of the credit for, for you know, building a church or wh whatever it may be. It doesn't matter um, in that service to God. God likes to get and receive all the glory as he, as he properly should get. And um, now, this is how God thinks. We've seen some examples, right? God likes using the few. God likes using the weak. God likes using these things. That's his part of it. But we have a part of it too. Obviously, if God's going to use you, well, you are an important factor of that equation. There's God and his plan and then you. Where do you fall into that plan? So in order for us to, to fill that role, we, that's going to require, obviously, a lot of faith. I mean, think about being in Gideon's shoes, right? We can see from God's perspective why he wants to do everything that way because God's saying, look, I'm going to get the victory. I'm going to get the glory for this battle. I don't want you thinking that you're mighty. Amen, that's great. Yeah, we could read that and understand that. But now put yourself in Gideon's shoes at this time being faced with a multitude <laughs> And, and God telling you, nah, get rid of these people. You have too many people. And you're thinking like, what do you mean? And you got to be thinking, you know, Gideon's probably thinking, how is this going to be possible at all? How, you know, God's telling me these people. Now, but, but what did Gideon do? He had faith. He believed God. And everything that God told him to do, he listened to him. He hearkened. Even if it doesn't make sense. Physically speaking, it didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to send all those troops. Hey, you're going to want everybody you possibly can to suit up and armor up to go and fight for you against this, this huge, huge army. But 
everything that God told him, he listened, he obeyed, and then what happened? Everything worked out the way God said. God's promises come true. But that requires a great deal of faith. Now, we need to have that type of a faith. We ought to have that in our daily life because God is looking to use you for certain things. God's, every individual here, God has a task for you to do. God has work for you to do. And you might think, well, I don't have these strengths. I'm just real weak. I don't have anything to do. Hey, have that faith to rely on God. God will strengthen you. God will give you what you need. If God has a job for you, God's not going to make you do something that you're not capable of doing. You may have to rely on him for it, but not, God's not going to say, okay, I need you to go and do this. And you're just completely incapable of doing it to the point to where he's not even going to help you. Let's say you are incapable of doing it. Like Gideon would be incapable of taking on all these people by himself. Well, if God's doing it for him, he just obeys and he says, okay, well, I'm going to step into this role that you have for me to do. Here I am. And I'm just going to listen and obey what you have for me to do. And that's the type of faith that we need to have to take out um, with, with whatever it is that God has called us to do. Now, in, um, you don't have to turn there. 1 Samuel 14, verse 6, we see this. Um, Jonathan has this, this great spirit inside of him. Um, it says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. God's not restricted by what we would be restricted in in this life with um, our, our physical capabilities. God has no restrictions on that. And that's when Jonathan and his armor bearer, just those two, start fighting an uphill battle against this garrison of the Philistines and they bring a great victory. Um, but there's, there's one particular place I want to apply this today in our lives. It's, it's one thing to talk in generalities and say, so, yeah, when God's you know, calling you to do something, you should just listen to him. You should do it. Okay, but how does that affect your daily life? And this is, gonna, this is where it's going to kind of springboard off of this morning's sermon with preaching the gospel to the lost. Because that is something, as I mentioned already this morning, where so many people have doubts and they say, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not good with explaining things. I'm not a good teacher. I'm not good at these things. I can't do it. And, and, and people will think that, that you know, that's what keeps them from going out and preaching to people is because of their feeling of inferiority and because of their feeling of weakness and saying, well, I don't know the Bible. I'm not good with words. I'm shy. I'm not a Bible expert. You know, maybe you haven't even read the Bible cover to cover one time. I don't know. Whatever it may be, whatever it is that's holding you back from doing this, Look, God has commanded for all of us to do it. He did not put a restriction on it and say, well, only, you know, you have to be at this level first. You have to have this much knowledge or you have to have this much practice talking to people. No, he didn't say any of that. He commanded us to go and God is capable to use us and to help us in the areas where we need help with. The Bible says in Isaiah 28, 11, turn if you would to Exodus chapter 4. Isaiah 28, 11 says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Stammering lips. That's the exact story I was telling you this morning about when I would go out and, and you know, the first person that I ever won to the Lord, I was stammering. I was stuttering. I didn't know what, you know, like I knew what I was saying, but I, I was fumbling with it. Not very smooth. Not very good. You would not take a video of that and be like, this is how you preach the gospel. You know, like, it was not the, the, the um, example that, that should be followed by everybody. But God used it. And it takes time to get used to this stuff. And it takes time to grow. And you can and do become better with these things. But you have to start off just in obedience to God and understand Hey, God wants you to do this. This is something that God is calling everybody to do. Now, God doesn't call everyone to be a pastor of a church. God doesn't call everyone to be a, a song leader or play a piano or whatever. All these different things and, and offices you can fill. God doesn't call everyone to be a deacon. But God calls everybody to witness to the lost. God calls everybody to preach the gospel to every creature. That is all of our calling. That is something we all have to do. And we should take heed to that 
and no, not make excuses for us. Even if you are weak in the flesh, hey, all the more reason to just trust God, have faith in Him and say, you know what? God will just help me through this. God will lead me. He's told me to do it. If I'm in, there's no way that you're incapable of doing it if God has told you to do it. There's no way. Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. We see here, Moses is called to be the leader of the people, of the children of Israel to bring them out of the land. This is a big deal. I mean, they're in bondage. And there's a huge, there's a great multitude of Israel that, that he is going to be the one that is the leader. And um, we see here in Moses' response with God, look at verse number 10, excuse me, of Exodus chapter 4. It says that Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. He's saying, I'm not good with words. I can't speak very well. I'm not eloquent. I speak and, and you know, I fumble with my words. I'm not good at it, God. Look at verse number 11. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. He's saying, look, don't you think I know this, Moses? I'm the one that made you. Who made that tongue in your mouth? God did. When you have these fears and say, look, I can't do this. I'm not good at speaking. I, there's no way I'm going to be able to, to, to show somebody how to be saved because I'm just not good at explaining things. Hey, God made your brain. God made your mouth. God can use you. You know, there's this great story. I love this. It, 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 back at, um, at Faith Forward Baptist Church, there was a girl that, that went there for a long time that had Down syndrome, right? And this is a perfect example. And this girl loved the Lord. She loved serving God, and she liked to go out soul winning. And she would actually go and, and get people saved. And again, she had a lot of ailments. She was mentally handicapped. It was, it was a harder time for her to go and give the gospel to people. You know, um, the way that she could explain things maybe wasn't as eloquent as, as most, you know, quote, unquote, normal people have. But look, God was made strong and glorified through her weakness. And that was a great thing. She had a willing heart. God looked at her and he saw her heart. And he used her to do some great things for him by people being saved and, and not going to hell. That she was able to do that. And it speaks to people. Look, when someone were to, if, if, you know, if someone like that were to come to your door, you'd probably listen to them even closer because... They're coming to you and trying. And I've mentioned this before, too, with, with Spanish. right? I'm not very good at the language, but I've noticed people have a tendency when I'm really just trying hard to speak in their tongue and the language that they understand, they seem to have a lot more grace with me than people who just speak English and don't want to have anything to do with what, you know, want, don't want to hear a word coming out of my mouth. People, when you try to go to them, you know, again, it's in weakness. But you're trying, and God can see your heart, and God can still use that, and God will still use you. Moses was a perfect example. Now, was Moses a great man of God? Absolutely. He did great things. I mean, he went, he confronted Pharaoh, he did all these great works. You know, he, he filled this position. He led the children through the, through the wilderness, and it came to the point he was judging Israel. People were coming at him with all these matters and stuff. This never came up again. But this is, remember, this is at first. This is before he'd done anything. This is before he, he had become a man of reputation, before he had gained experience, before he'd actually done and started doing these things that God told him to do. His first reaction is, you know, I, I can't speak well. And honestly, that was my first reaction of thinking about going soul winning and, and talking to people at the door is that I'm shy. It scares me to go and just talk to somebody I don't even know. I don't like doing it. God has called us to do this. God knows your weaknesses. If you're going to step up and do what God has for you to do, God will give you what you need to get through it. God will give you that strength. God will make up the difference of whatever is required to fulfill what he has, had, what he has for you to do. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to get one more example here. 
Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to see how Jeremiah was. Jeremiah is somewhat of a similar response that Moses did. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 4 says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. He's saying to God, you know, God saying, Look, before I even formed you in the belly, before I made you, I knew you, because God knows all things. He knows the beginning from the end. Before, you know, there's going to be people born next week. God already knows them. He doesn't have to wait for them to be born before he knows them. God already knows them because he knows all things, which is the same, you know, same thing with Jeremiah. But he says, you know, look, I knew you and I ordained you to be a prophet. God had a plan for Jeremiah's life. His plan was that, yeah, I want you to be a prophet. The same way God's got a plan for all of our lives that are saved to go out and preach the gospel to the lost. And even people who aren't saved yet, he's got a plan for them that they should get saved and go preach the gospel to the lost. That's God's plan. That's what God has planned out for him. You know, he's ordained here, Jeremiah, to be a prophet. But Jeremiah answers him and says, wait, I can't speak. He's, I'm a child. I'm young. Now, I don't know if he's necessary meaning specifically because of his age or just in his understanding or whatever. But he's probably, you know, he's young. He said, I'm, look, I'm just, a, I'm just a child. I can't, you know, I can't speak. Verse number seven, let's see what God answers him with. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So God's saying, look, don't say that, oh, I'm just a child, I can't speak. Because God's the one giving him what to, sp what to say. When we go out and preach the gospel, we have God's word. We don't have to rely on our own words. Thankfully, we don't have to rely on that. We have God's word to bring with us and to show people and to say, look, this is what the Bible says. It says this. It says you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have his words. This is what we're relying on. And he says, be not afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of the reaction at the door. Don't be afraid of how people are going to respond to you. He says, I'm with you. I'm there with you. And this is where our faith comes in. We have to understand when we go out, we're going to go out in the spirit of God bringing the precious seed to get people saved. Hey, we don't have to fear what man is going to say or think or if they're going to make a mean face at us. Don't be afraid of that. God will be with you. You're going out and doing his work. You're walking in his ways. Hey, God's with you. And God's directing your steps. Keep that in mind. The Bible says in verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So those were two, two examples with um, Moses and with Jeremiah, both extremely great men of God in the Bible. Did a lot of things to serve God. They both had that fear. Look, that fear is natural, but it's not of God. We need to overcome that. We need to understand, hey, maybe you are weak. That's fine. Maybe you aren't good with words. Fine. But God will still use you. Don't use that as your excuse not to go out. Don't use any of your inabilities, any of your lackings, or your shortcomings as an excuse to not serve God and to not be obedient unto Him. He wants your obedience. He'll help you with the rest of the way, but you have to have the faith to know that. Look at who Jesus chose to be His disciples. Did Jesus come and start choosing the scribes and the Pharisees? He says, well, hey, we need to go and teach these people, so I'm going to pick these, this scribe and this Pharisee and, this, you know, and these people. No. Who do you choose? Fisherman, publican. You know, he, he chose regular guys. You know, ignorant men. We saw that this morning too. The world looked at them. They said they're ignorant men, but they had been with Jesus. They knew God, and that's who God used. And He used His disciples greatly, and God wants to use you greatly too. Don't ever think that God can't use you. If you're still alive today, God's got something for you. I believe that with my heart. 
He's got some way for you to serve him. I think when God is just done with us, that's when he'll take us home. When we've done everything that God wants us to do, he'll take us back, he'll take us home to be with him. Because there'll be no more purpose left for us to, to be on this, on this earth. But as long as you're alive, as long as you're here, as long as you're breathing today, God has a plan for you and for your life and for what he wants you to do. Make the best of your situations. Maybe you have some kind of a physical ailment like Paul did. You know, Paul prayed to God, which is a right thing to do. You have problems ailing you. You have, you have physical inabilities, whatever it may be. Hey, bring those to God. But ultimately, you just have to rely on God and work through it. God may choose not to answer that prayer. God chose not to answer Paul's prayer. He says, nope, I want this to be like this. This is my will, that you're in this condition. And because he wants his strength to be, to be made perfect in weakness. And Paul heard that and he rejoiced. So whatever it is in your, you know, in your situation, make the best of it and rejoice in it. And say, you know what? God can use my inabilities or my, my weaknesses to do great things. Um, and use your unique situation. You know, some people, you're put in a situation, whether it be um, you know, physical or whatever. Sometimes I think the reason that these things happen to us it's not for necessarily for judgment or anything, but maybe God's directing you in a path to where you'll meet people, to where you'll be in certain situations down the road where you can you know, get somebody saved or where you can have an impact on someone else's life and, and you can do things. And we don't see that you know, right, up, right at first when things happen, but they, you know, later on you tend to see what the reason is behind it. We're going to um, close with this. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is the last place we're going to turn. I'm going to, kind of, I'm going to try to cover this briefly because we've co I've covered this in another sermon before as well. But in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, look at verse number 12. We're going to start reading there. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jew or Gen Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So what we're seeing here is you know, this likening of us being members of the body of Christ. See, God has put us in places where it pleased him. There's an entire church body that we have here. There's many members of the body, but it's one body. Now, in order for this body to be functioning properly, we need all kinds of different aspects, different members to make us whole, to make us complete, right? Just like your body. You have hands, you have feet, you have legs, arms, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, all these different things. They all perform a different function. They're all different functions and they're all useful. Is what he's trying to explain here. Now, you can't have everyone as a hand, right? Your, other, your body you can't just be made up of just a bunch of hands. That would be silly. And that's what he's explaining here. He's like, look, everyone's not going to be the same. You're not going to have the same function to fulfill in this body. And in the body of this church, we're all going to have a different role to play. And we'll look what he's saying here in verse 22. He says, nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. So what he's saying is like, you know, you think of like comely parts. Oh, you have such beautiful hair or you have such, be you know, when people look at your physical body, right? They'll look at a lot of aspects 
that really don't have a great function to serve. There is a function, but they may look real beautiful outwardly, but the, the overall function is real small. But then you look at something like, you know, a liver and be like, that doesn't look very comely. <laughs> that's not, that's not, you would look at that and be like, wow, that's real pretty. But it performs a very, very important, great function in your body. You know, there's so many other parts of your body. You think about the most important ones, you know, they don't get as much credit necessarily as what they deserve. But it says here that um, having given more honor, given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. So those parts that, that may not look as good, God gives more honor unto that. And all that just basically to say, you know, God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. We may think that you're, you know, you might think that your job isn't that important or, um, or maybe you don't have very many skills or whatever, but we all have a role to fill in this church. And don't minimize your role as a member of this body. And in fact, whatever, whatever you know, however you kind of fit in, wherever your role is going to be, well, um, um, you know, reaching out to people, helping people. I, I've gone over a lot of different things that we can do within this church to help others out, to bring people in. Whatever your abilities are, hey, use them to the best of your ability. Be that, be that the best person you can be in your role, in your function. You know, if you're a hand, hey, strengthen your hand. Get your hand going good. Be able to make some fists. Be able to do some high fives. You know, whatever. All these different things. Make the best use out of it. You know, um, if you're, you know, I'll use an example like a song leader. Hey, if you're a song leader, you know, learn more songs. Be the best at that you can be. Practice a lot. Do whatever it can be. You know, talking to people out on the street. You know, just, just being comforting to people. Sending emails. Getting on the phone. Visiting. Whatever it may be. You know, helping people out in different ways. Just be the best in that, you know, in, in that portion, in that area that you are that member of this body and that's kind of what you do and, and where you fit in. And um, we all have a role. And maybe you don't know what that role is yet, but um, we all have the same common role of going out and preaching the gospel. And I hope that you all join us on Saturday for our great soul winning marathon. And don't let anything hold you back. We've gone over a lot of stuff this morning on, on just helpful you know, tips on, on how we go about doing it when you talk to people. And also, if you think that you have a weakness in a certain area that's preventing you from going out and talking to people, don't let that stop you from being obedient unto Christ. Hey, rather just, just understand God will get glorified by that. But you have to be willing. You have to put yourself out there and say, I am going to disobey and have faith and trust that God can actually use me too. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for using us, dear God, even though we are weak, and especially when we're weak, dear God. We have so many ailments. We have so many shortcomings in, in um, our physical bodies, dear Lord. We thank you for loving us despite our shortcomings, and we, and we thank you for using us and, and being able to use us, dear God. I pray that you would please continue to use. Hey, we're a very small church, dear God. People might laugh and scoff at us and, and think that it's funny that we're meeting in a house, dear God. But I pray that, that you will help us to do great things just to bring that more honor and glory unto your name that we can have a great impact on, on people's lives even though we're small right now, dear God. And we pray that you would please just continue to build us. Help us all to grow. Help us all to have the faith that we need to just completely trust you in, in obeying and doing what you have for us to do and have that faith that we need to go out and do sometimes the things that make us uncomfortable, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.